All right. Moving on, our upcoming panelists will discuss the future of legal technology and how to optimize your use of these tools. Please put your hands together for the speakers. We have Mr. Ashish Jain, founder of Samvidhan Attorneys at Law. Welcome, Ashish. And Josh Dahlia, Legal Counsel, Office of Advocate. Josh Dahlia, welcome. And the topic is doing more with less, optimizing your legal tech toolkit. Welcome, gentlemen. If we could set the timer, please. I'm sorry? Ah, you just click it upwards, sir. Yes. And please save some time for questions from the audience. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's had a nice lunch. Yep, seems like it. So we have a very interesting topic because this is not just relevant to the present, but this is definitely the future. Technology is now much more integrated into law than it ever was, like it is in every other field. You know, we've, we've had so many cases where technology has managed to bring much more to law than it has to bring to much more other fields. For example, we've had something where something as simple as a professional legal calendar integration. Now, for lawyers, as we all know, you know, time is a very essential topic for us. And we keep adding things to our notes, adding things to our calendar. This used to be the old school ways. We used you'll generally see lawyers carrying journals or diaries around with them. Now that's really changed because now we've got these algorithmic AI-based calendars which get integrated with your Google calendars or your Apple calendars and likewise. What they essentially do, they are not calendars that list down what you have to do for the day, but that they are calendars which list down when your matters are coming, what your matters are, what are they relevant to, the kind of, the, and, the, and the deepness to that is that you can add the clientele, the clientele, uh, the client is also informed of the same, has the same dates, the, you can put in your notes, you can put in the parties, you can put in stuff like who are your relevant associates or your juniors who are working on the matter. Everybody is integrated to that. Now what essentially that does is something so simple as, you know, uh, for me personally, I used to face a major difficulty when moving across courts that how does one keep track of their matters. You know, five days later, six days, a week later, somebody will just, a client will just message me or reach out to me saying, what happened to my, in my matter? What is the next step? What are we to do now? Now that can effectively be gone and I can focus on the f way forward because what is that happening is they're getting the same messages I'm getting. They're getting the same integrated messages. They're getting aware of what, is, what happened in the last date, what, hap what is going to happen now. So that reduces the burden of memory which is taxed upon us. You know, and as a counsel, as, as some and as a counsel and as an arbitrator where I've had to jump across various faucets, various courts, sometimes even cross borders, it's very important that I can live more into what I actually have to do and not just worry about what happened. More so, I think technology has really evolved in the way lawyers run their case management. Me, for example, um, I mean, an average lawyer's office will be filled with files. You know, you will have, I mean, Ashish will also testify to like, there'll be a large space filled with files. Some of which are nearly redundant, some of which are important, but they'll have a lot of information, a lot of papers, which at the end of it, you won't know what to do with it. Now. For me, a lot of my information has now been scanned in. A lot of that has been turned into digital documentation, which is easily accessible. Things like OCR, optical, optical character recognition has come into place where it's basically reading stuff. I can search things into my documents which were not accessible before. I don't need to keep flipping pages for everything. I put in the search and I find out everything that's relevant to it. Something as simple as my orders, my notes, my documentation, everything has been synergized together and it, it's automatically updated. I mean, of course, we have to update it as and when, but it's, it's that much less strenuous and we don't need to keep carrying around moving quotes to you know carry papers, big files across with us. Courts have also acknowledged the same, especially in India earlier, 
we weren't allowed to carry our cell phones, we weren't allowed to carry our laptops as such, but now that's slowly evolving. Judges are also understanding the same. They're also reading out, out of laptops, they're reading out of tablets, they're understanding the importance of something like this. And so is the acceptance for something, which I felt was very important over time. Uh, a very important thing where technology also helps is case research. Now, originally, as we all know, we used to screen through multiples and multiples of books of course, that still happens now, and that's the ethos of what legal research is. But now it's much more evolved with AI coming into the place where they screen the research for you. You know, many a times you're just thinking of a vague topic, you start researching it, go within, go within, go within, and you eventually come to your place. Now what that does, it picks upon what you're trying to research through, guides you to the right direction, and you eventually reach where you have to much faster saving you time to you know, focus on things which are much more important. Then you have something which is known as court time management. Now, I've personally used softwares which really help uh, manage my schedules in that sense where when my name has been fed in and in any matter which is related to cases where I am one of the representatives, I immediately get aware of the same. The moment that case has been filed and has, the data has been put in the server. What used to happen earlier was we'd receive a shock in evening before the matter that, you know, this matter has been listed tomorrow, make yourself available. And a very simple dialogue that we like to write to people, you can be aware should you choose, you can be present should you desire and should you want to be present. Now what essentially means is we've informed you, if you've had any difficulty, we've informed you on the 11th hour, if you faced any difficulty, it's your fault. And what happens by that, they'll get a stay, they'll get an ex parte hearing, they'll, they'll basically get, uh, they'll put you into trouble and put your clients into trouble. Now, what this helps is I'm informed much in advance, even before the other side informs me of a case that they filed, the moment they file it, the moment that goes into the server, I'm aware of the same, because it's been tracked through my name. And I feel that's something very important and relevant for people who are always on the run, because we're all traveling, now it's no longer us sitting in one office, one chamber, fighting in one court. What virtual courts have essentially in that virtual hearings have also done is that you can spread your wings across multiple cities, multiple jurisdictions in the same day and not waste time in traveling and the allied uh, difficulties in that. Uh, more so an important aspect that comes with technology is that of networking. Now, in various jurisdictions, lawyers have given that much more freedom. But we come, we come from India where it's very difficult for your lawyer to solicit themselves. It's virtually impossible. There's a very fine line between making ones relevant to, network, uh, to marketing and or soliciting oneself. So hence, these networking platforms, like I really use LinkedIn very nicely and I think it's very important for somebody jumping into the field or somebody diving into the field or even people who are very much established to have a good LinkedIn presence because you never know who reaches out to you, who's reading them at what point of time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this time last year, a large a global multinational groups general counsel just glanced through my profile, found it interesting enough reached out to me through LinkedIn personal messaging. We, about cases related to foreign banks in India. And we had our negotiations. We, we managed to close the deal and now they're amongst my largest clients. But this purely happened not because of me reaching out to anyone or showcasing myself. I was just there and there about when somebody needed to come to me. And they found that they, the stuff I do, the stuff I've done was relevant to them. Which is why it's very important where you can't solicit yourself. It's very important to make sure you're, when somebody reaches out to you or reaches out to your pages, they have the relevant kind of information that's fed in. Uh, and I've, as I've said, outreach. Now, another faucet of not being able to sell oneself or market oneself is you are not able to reach out to people. That's where a lot of these legal portals have come in and they're across the globe now, but they're more so there in Asia and India where you know, uh, foreign nationals, even locals, they're looking for specific topics or particular kind of case help or documentation help or stuff where they don't know who to reach out to. 
So they reach out to these portals. These portals screen their requests, match them to the right kind of advocate, and essentially the advocate is able to reach, also get access to the client, and the client is able to reach out to the right kind of person to deal the information with them. That's also a great integration where it increases the outreach of the lawyer. It makes sure that you know a lawyer is able to reach out to many people, is able to speak about many things, is not having to spend time reaching out to people, but is able to access people, data, information through these portfolios. And something also that I really wanted to speak about was, uh, as most of you all would be aware, is ODR, which is Online Dispute Resolution. Uh, dispute resolution is actually, for what I firmly believe, is the way forward. And now, what has happened is because of the pandemic hitting us, because of the integration, sudden integration of virtual courts, I really feel India on its own has also grown forward. A lot of developing nations has grown forward as far as the way law is perceived and the way access to judiciary and access to justice is there. Through these online dispute resolutions and such portals, you are able to sit in your backyard, sit in your office. The other person is able to sit in their particular office, maybe anywhere across the globe, have the judge or the arbitrator or the mediator or the dispute resolutor sit anywhere where they're there. The seat is pre-decided. The, the procedure, whether to follow the SIAC rules or whether to follow the Hong Kong arbitration rules or the Indian arbitration rules or likewise, London arbitration rules, that is also decided in that sense we are able to run an entire case without having to move out. We are able to solve that without having to travel across countries, travel across the cities. And that is also a decree within itself, which is a proper certified decree, which is enforceable in law. And as we all know, a lot of our countries, a lot of our countries have integrated laws where you know a judgment of one court is valid across the globe in many co-signatory countries. Hence, something like this is really important because that is not just some, it's basically allowing law to reach out not just on the global scale, not just on a national scale, but also allowing law through data, through technology, through infrastructure to reach out to those various villages and unknown places where people couldn't have access to justice before. There, thanks to ODR, uh, there are so many national, we, in India we have something as the National Lok Adalat, which happens everywhere, where essentially a lot of these local and unreachable cases where people have filed cases which are pending since years, they, they go through three days of process and most of them are tried to be solved through settlement. But that can only happen when there is such portal and there is such access provided to them. And I see it's virtually impossible and for one to be ever present and be everywhere, but these things make sure that you are as present as possible into various locations. Uh, I feel, I really feel technology and legal, for, especially for younger lawyers, is really important because they help you fast forward your career. When, back in the day when I started my practice, I was told, especially for councils, that you know, you need to wait for six, seven years for you to be really relevant, for you to be, for you to find the right kind of clientele, you may have to work for free, you may have to work into various things, but that's not the case. I see my growth has really charted well from working on my own to having an office which has about 25 odd lawyers inside, about 30 more lawyers which work with me outside my office, offices spread across. Now those, and allowing me time to spread my wings onto various specters of law. I mean, law is a huge umbrella. There's only that much that you can do. But these are the kind of things that really help one grow, grow and grow in the right direction and really fast. Now with that, I'll, I'll pause in for a bit and I'd really love Ashish to give us a few words on this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, you've given us an insight into the day-to-day -day life of a lawyer and how technology has been a great equalizer in terms of how law is practiced across uh, across various countries. Uh, today, technology uh, is not only helping lawyers manage their cases, but it is also enabling the industry as such with their research, with the kind of drafting that is required. As a council, uh, 
practicing in any field, you spend most of your time doing two things. One is research and the second is drafting. Today, you have large technology companies who are investing great sums of money in this kind of technology. We have also seen investments from various multinationals into their own organizations to enable law take care of itself. The need for a person to sit down and research, the need for a person to sit down and draft has, I think, almost been eliminated because the machines or the technology used in these activities are very, very efficient and more importantly, they are error free. When there is a human element involved in any form of activity, there are chances of errors and errors can spiral into costs. Technology has enabled us to get rid of these errors and do or achieve the result in a much quicker and faster manner. Going a step further, we have seen across the globe certain jurisdictions using chatbots or artificial intelligence, machine learning tools to decide cases which do not require any form of evidence being adduced, which do not require any form of arguments being advanced. These cases are simply fed into the desired system and the result is produced. The legislature in these countries are designed in such a fashion that these judgments or orders or pronouncement made by these artificial bots are non-appealable and they, they are very much limited to say traffic offenses say uh, statutes which do not require chance of an appeal. These are uh, laws of the land which have to be implemented and here any involvement of humans is being cut out completely. Apart from uh, how technology is enabling lawyers today to practice across the globe, it has also enabled lawyers to ease their practice. In, uh, in, I, th I think across the globe, uh, during the pandemic, uh, there has been very speedy uptake of online hearings or hearings where lawyers need not be present in the court before a judge. Uh, if I would like to be India specific, uh, I think uh, lawyers as such, the legal community as such, is very, very resistant to change. We don't like change at all. We like to follow the system that has been set. We like to uh, just uh, carry on with how it is going on. Fortunately for us, uh, in, in the Indian legal system, in its apex court, the Supreme Court, uh, they've had some really wonderful judges who are heading the E-Committee, uh, who are putting their foot down and ensuring that the smallest courts in the country are equipping themselves with technology in order to help litigants. Gone are those days when a litigant would struggle to get a matter listed, would struggle to find a hearing before a judge, or would struggle to find a lawyer to do his case. Technology as such has been an extremely great equalizer in terms of helping a litigant conduct his case. He is well informed in, a pub in the public domain of what has happened to his case. He is well informed of what are the documents that have filed in support of his case. And the more magical part is he is today able to sit at the comfort of his home or in his chamber, in his boardroom, in the office and watch his lawyer perform. A few courts in India have enabled public streaming of cases as and when they are being argued. So uh, 
the the fraternity as such was very resistant to this the bar was very resistant to this and now i think we have come to realize that this has or this is slowly restoring the faith in judiciary in the way we function and uh, in the method in which we go about conducting a particular case this uh, this does not that it does not come uh, with devils behind its back uh, we've had some funny incidents in courts in in parliament in fact uh, 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 where uh, things uh, which should not have been caught on camera have been caught on camera but i think it is part and parcel of how le a legal toolkit enabled by technology is helping the litigant per se the mindset where the legal fraternity used to be among itself they promote themselves they uh, appreciate each other and uh, uh, even 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 the system of appointing judges today is slightly changed there is a lot of talk of uh, uh, in a country as diverse as india there is a lot of talk of even changing the system by which judges are being appointed this is all thanks to one simple thing technology because technology is enabling number of stakeholders to come on board to express their views and more importantly to know what exactly is going on it's no longer clouded behind black robes but it is open to the public to the litigant to see how their cases are being handled there is one last thing i would like to add with respect to tech in the legal fraternity we are always surrounded by books we are always surrounded by paper and we are always surrounded by documents which need to be filed which need to be compiled so on and so forth there is the national company law tribunal which uh, deals with company cases in india they have a system uh, the unfortunate part is the leading body which governs the national company law tribunal is the ministry of corporate affairs and not the judiciary because what the ministry of corporate affairs has done is this they have said as a blanket rule that all your filings are going to be only online they do not accept filings physically no physical papers are to be submitted before these these courts these tribunals these are quasi judicial bodies but they have started approaching or for a few years have been approaching the legal fraternity or the legal cases paperless they have big screens before them they are accessing these screens and we are able to conduct these cases uh, the supreme court did this a lot of high courts did this during the pandemic but uh, uh, today it is unfortunate that uh, we are all creatures of habit and the judiciary prefers us to be in front of them in person uh, now uh, uh, with with uh, the chief justice of india who is also heading the e committee taking charge and having a lot of time on his hands i think he's in charge for over a year and a half now from from date uh, i firmly believe that there is going to be a monumental change in how technology is going to be used and how technology is going to enable litigants to handle their cases better yes thank you ashish you've really spread across how machine learning technology data is really the go forward you know those are the backbone for various fundamental changes that are happening across the board but i had a question for you you mentioned machine learning data but with that is also especially both of us come from a country where cases are considered sacred cases are considered private in that sense a lot of cases are considered private now machine learning data what essentially that is doing is taking things uh, open in that sense there's a lot of breach of privacy that is happening there's a, there are data banks now so 
as my friend mentioned, the National Company Law Tribunal. The National Company Law Tribunal has also opened up information utilities. Now those information utilities are essentially data banks. They're storing you numbers and numbers of case information, information about corporates and individuals which are otherwise not accessible to the general public. But how do you say that with so much data coming in, isn't that a breach of privacy somewhere? Isn't that somewhere where things are accessible? Maybe not directly, but indirectly somebody can reach out to such information, which they otherwise, and get an unfair advantage where there was none before? Yes. Uh, with any new technology, I think uh, the core of privacy is always going to be affected. When we talk of cases uh, and uh, courts, the documents, once they are filed in court, they become public documents. And related parties can follow the procedure, apply for these documents and get the copies. But with respect to data breach and uh, the amount of data that is fed into these systems, uh, we go parallel on the great debate which we had with respect to the unique identification number system that was brought about in India very recently. Uh, the, the, the argument was that biometrics were being taken of every citizen in the country and a unique identification number called Aadhaar was being issued. So you, unique identification numbers are not new for developed economies. England, UK has them, the United States has them. And now India has followed suit. Every citizen, it is as good as his proof of citizenship. The unique identification number today is as good as his proof of citizenship. There was a lot of protest with respect to biometrics being taken and stored in a government database. The courts went through the round of litigation and it was said that, yes, your privacy is extremely important. It will be protected. And without your consent, it will not be shared. Unfortunately, this did not coordinate or fall in place well with GDPR being implemented in India. We are still, uh, we, we, I think we've gone through seven or six rounds of modifying the GDPR. It's been heavily changed from what uh, the guidelines have been laid down. And uh, this, uh, is, is, this, is an, this is a perennial issue because courts in India have always protected privacy. Aadhaar is probably one of the first cases, the unique identification number is one of the first cases where the government and the judiciary worked together and acknowledged that the benefits that you are going to get from having unique identification numbers for each citizen far outweighs the remote chance of your privacy being invaded. This is one facet of the entire argument. The second facet with respect to corporates having the advantage to access their competitors' documents or case files uh, is, is something that has not yet happened and I hope it will not happen. Even if it does, I think uh, it has to be taken uh, uh, along the way and we will have to deal with it. Uh, we'll have to cross the bridge when we get there. What is most impressive is as a country, India today is very, very receptive to technology and the legal field is not far behind. Thank you, Ashish. In fact, I feel not just India, but on a global stage, uh, the legal toolkits have really made people aware to various new avenues and making life easier across the globe to access re uh, good legal uh, assistance or good legal consultation in a particular jurisdiction. For example, uh, we are also, we along with my global partners, we are working on a particular platform where we are going to allow people to purchase certain legal remedies in buckets, which would then enable those buckets to reach the right kind of 
a legal professional. The legal professional will get the job done in a particular guideline, and those buckets would be resolved within a particular time frame. Now, those are kind of things which was going to give speedy access to judicial remedies in various jurisdictions. For example, if I need remedy in, say, the Netherlands, if I need some legal research, it helps me to access the ki right kind of people and not waste time over some things. So I, th I think both of us together will really agree to one thing that uh, these toolkits are really important and they've really helped optimizing the way law is perceived, the way law is growing forward. But along with that, uh, we need to really optimize ourselves and be acceptable towards them, to integrate them into our life as well as our professions, to take it forward in the right directions. Thank you for the same, and uh, would you like to say something? Yeah, just to add a few final words to uh, how uh, this legal toolkit is essential for the practice of law. There are a few takeaways uh, from this discussion. The first being that we cannot ignore the power of technology, be it any industry. We are in a conference today which uh, on the topics of law and money. We have seen in our demographic, in the Indian jurisdiction, we have seen zero broking companies who have enabled investment in stock markets to the masses. Investment in stock markets, in stocks, securities, used to be reserved for the elite and for the men who knew all. Today, technology companies have come in and are offering such great products which enable any common man to invest in the securities market, to invest in the bond market. In fact, uh, the Prime Minister of India is also very, very keen to equalize through technology. He came forward with the idea that Indians love gold. He came forward with the idea that, yes, I agree Indians love gold, but the gold is just sitting in your cupboard. It is not earning you any interest, nor are you contributing to the economy in any fashion? They came forward with this proposal of issuing gold bonds. These gold bonds can be bought as low as for a gram, and it, 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 you can buy, I think there is a cap on how much an individual can buy. But the point being, you are holding gold digitally. You are holding gold without having to spend for the security of the gold. It is part of a dematerialized account which holds securities. It is part of a bank account which you can materialize at any point of time. So India as such has been very, very proactive in opening up these markets using technology. And very recently, they have also opened up the bond market. Certain sections of the bond market were reserved uh, only to institutions. Today, that is not the case. Uh, this has been opened up to individuals as well. Technology, without technology, without the toolkit to enable this technology, this would not have happened. And thankfully, at an institutional level, the country is adapting these technologies and over the years, we have seen that it is the common man who is benefiting. Of course, as professionals, we are required to use these technologies to save time, to be more efficient, to, to, to work a little less. But the beneficiary of these technologies are, in the legal fraternity, it's probably the litigant. And in the finance uh, sector, I think, Every common man has got the opportunity to invest, the opportunity to save, and the opportunity to, to expand or explore different investment opportunities. I think uh, uh, the best is yet to come. Technology is ever evolving, and we hope that as industries, both legal and finance, we are able to open our minds to it, 
adapt these technologies and uh, grow. Thank you. I, we've got a minute. I think we can take a question. We can take one question, yes? Yes, go ahead, sir. The microphone is just behind you. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for this uh, lovely session. Thank you for this lovely session. Uh, you were talking about uh, ODR systems, and I'm wondering what's your opinion about automated ODR system, which means um, systems who actually will uh, reduce the action of uh, mediators and lawyers, not put them outside of the picture, but will help them um, with the, the burden of cases in courts. Yes, uh, there are two ways to look at ODR. One is enabling the uh, dispute resolution personnel who's been appointed, a mediator, to use tech to interact with both the parties. The other side is to let these decisions be taken with machines who have the capability to machine learn, who have been fed with information as to how a certain problem needs to be devised. I think personally, we feel that ODR through automated systems is the way forward. Otherwise, it is just uh, you're using uh, another form of a meeting. Instead of meeting in a room, uh, you're, you're, you're meeting through technology. Uh, that may be a stopgap solution, but ultimately, we should arrive and I'm sure we will arrive where certain disputes are resolved through the ODR mechanism. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much. In fact, I just want to add one thing to what Ashish said. One more very important thing is the decisions that come out, they really need good enforceability across the globe. Like that law is also evolving, that understanding is also evolving, where acceptance of decisions, where people felt this is online. Now, this is not just considered online, but this is as real as it can get. And acceptability is evolving and that needs to add to give enforceability to it. Otherwise, it's just going to add more and more time to things as they come about. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Josh Ashish. My legal Tech Toolkit, if we can pose for a quick photo. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. One chair, please, sir. <laughs> 